It's my pleasure to welcome Everett Longstreth. He was m director of the concert jazz band from approximately 1968 to 1995. There seems to be some <laughs> um, controversy about that, but we'll get into that. Um, um, he is a well-regarded trumpet player and arranger and currently leads the Everett Longstreth Orchestra. It is March 30th, 2011. We are in the studio at, of MIT Academic Media Production Services. Thank you so much for coming. Also with me, participating in um, asking questions, is Frederick Harris, who is the current director of the MIT Festival Jazz Ensemble. And thank you, Fred, for coming. So Everett, tell me, where you were born and what year? <laughs> born in Columbus, Ohio, in 1930. Wow. And um, tell me about your, your parents. Your father was Albert, and your mother's name was Ruth. Is that right. correct? Yep. Exactly. So first tell me about your, your mother. Was she a musician? Both were musicians. Uh -huh. And my whole basic family was in show business. Uh, early on, vaudeville. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, my grandmother, oh my. and my mother, when she was growing up, all were in vaudeville. And now, uh, when we were when we were kids, my uh, my folks had a radio show in the morning on one of the local stations. Do you remember the station name? No, W uh, B. I forget what it was. B N S maybe. Oh yeah, right. W B N S. There's yeah, still Columbus. Columbus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, that that was <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. did it every morning. I oh. think it was like a, like a six o'clock a.m. show. <laughs> uh huh. So what kind of stuff so did they do on the show? It just uh, was like probably what they call variety show. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of talk and play and skits, things mm -hmm. like that. So your so mother, she was a singer. Was mother sang. Uh, everybody basically sang yeah. a little bit. And uh -huh. So, uh, but yeah. It was just typical vaudeville thing, right. you know. Play, tell stories, mm -hmm. you know, talk, whatever. And your mom probably played piano as well. No, she didn't. No, no. My mother actually played bass. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, so wow. My father had a band. Uh huh. That and a dance hall, you know, like a ballroom mm -hmm. out in uh, West Jefferson, Ohio. Wow, I'll ask more about that in, in a little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, how long did this radio show go? It went several years. Uh -huh. I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But uh, because they were up and out so early, we always had a lady that stayed with us. I see. With the kids. Yeah. So, so. didn't get left home alone. <laughs> <laughs> So you told me your father was a sax player. Did he play other instruments as well? He played violin oh, and, and basically reeds. Uh, mm -hmm. But as far as most of the time, it was alto and soprano. Oh, interesting. And then uh, we, with the ballroom, we had the, what they called round and square dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he played violin on all the square dance things. Mm -hmm. so. Well, there was a real kind of dance band tradition in, in Columbus that coming out of that. There was a guy named Earl Hood who was a violinist and band leader, and so there's a real tradition there. And yeah, there was for that kind of you thing. know, several bands around. I, I, my mind, I can't tell you who they are. Yeah, I got some more. We'll get to yeah. later about jazz in Columbus, and I got uh, some names that I'll run by you to see if I can jog your memory. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> um, tell me about uh, any siblings you have, and. Um, uh, I had a stepbrother and stepsister. Uh huh. Uh, I never considered them that. You know, we just grew up together. We were young, and it just—I never thought of them as, you know, stepbrother, mm -hmm. stepsister. Yeah. <laughs> it was just sister and brother. Right. Were they musicians? Are they musicians? They, we all played. Uh huh. Growing up, uh, I played trumpet. My brother played. Like reeds, usually tenor sax. And your brother's name is Robert. Uh huh. And Bob. And your and my sister was Betty. Uh huh. And she actually played drums. Cool. Yeah. And 
did a little bit of singing, uh -huh. you know, growing up, you know, all that. And at one time we all played, you know, with my father's band. Mm -hmm. That's basically where I learned how to play. Right. And your fa father's band, the name of the band was, was what? Just Al Longstreth Orchestra. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Did your father yeah. teach as well? He taught some privately, uh -huh. uh, not in any structured place, you right. know, but just private lessons. Was he teaching both saxophone and violin? Yeah, he taught a little bit of everything. You uh -huh. know, when I started, I, st you know, started with trumpet with him. So. So he could play enough trumpet that he. Yeah, he knew enough about it, mm -hmm. you know, to, you know, mm -hmm. teach it. Yeah. Yeah. Were there other teachers, private teachers, you had as a child? Uh, n pretty much not till I got to college, mm -hmm. and when I got up here, at Berkeley, uh, yeah. yeah, Berkeley, I had uh, a guy Berkeley. named Fred Berman. Right. At one time, when I first got here, it was Fred. Uh, and there was a trombone player. There was a guy named. Uh, I forgot his name. Well, another trumpet teacher was Harry Fink oh, for a uh -huh. while, and then John Coffey. Uh huh. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll ask you more about those in a, yeah. in a little bit. Um, um, so, with your um, family of, of, of musicians, it just wasn't probably for your father. It probably wasn't a choice of being a musician. It was just kind of in the blood. Yeah. Well, we all grew up with it. Yeah. My sister and brother didn't stay with it. Uh -huh. I'm the only one that actually mm -hmm. ended up staying with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we first You know, he told us to decide what we wanted to play. You know, because we always, as kids, we were always around the dance hall, you know, listening and, you know, we're always exposed to it. But he said, think about it. He said, because once you pick something, you're not changing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, you know, whatever you pick, that's uh -huh. what you were going to do. You wow. know, it wasn't going to be. I want to try this for a week and that for a week. Mm -hmm. that definitely wasn't the way he was. <laughs> wow. So how did you come to choose the trumpet? I don't know. I just, you know, the, I guess the one that, you know, I liked the best, although it was not a great choice. <laughs> Why do you say that? No, it's just a hard instrument. Yeah. You know, <laughs> keep in shape is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. You know, people's... You know, I say I got to practice, and they say, "What? You know, you're practicing. You're, you still practice?" <laughs> he says, "Yeah, you better believe it." Yeah, really? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So your your father's um, orchestra—they played for dances, but did they also do um, other kinds of shows? No. Well, at at the ballroom, we we played dances all the time. Mm -hmm. Used to work probably at least three nights a week. You know, Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. Sometimes four. You know, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, but on basically on a steady basis. Yeah. You know, they ran the dances and you know had a good following. So mm -hmm. the you know the place was full most of the time. Right. So. Right. Was your father kind of a, a freelance musician who played with other pit orchestras? And no. Stuff like well, that, not. I think when he was young, yeah. Yeah. I know. At one point, he had an offer to go out with uh, Pee Wee Hunt, mm -hmm. you know, the 12th Street Rag. Yeah. Yeah. And but he didn't do that because of, you know, family stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, he didn't play, mostly he worked for himself, mm -hmm. and he didn't play with other local bands. Mm -hmm. Did you ever play for silent films? No, I don't think so. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Mm hmm. Yeah. There were some um, saxophone players who were active in uh, in Columbus in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. I want to see if any of these names ring a bell. Rusty Bryant? I know the name. Uh-huh. Yeah. What about Louis um, Transu? No. Um, Paul P.C. Couser? No. Um, Phil McDale? No. Or um, Milton Doc Payne? No. Okay, I was just wondering if... Yeah, what yeah, these How are, early were they? Well, these were 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I was thinking yeah, maybe no, your I'm father might have known some of those. Yeah, no. Yeah. Rusty Bryant, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, he he's, he's, seems like he's the most well-known. Yeah. And there was a guy, Lucian Wright. Um, he's described in one book as the, the first person to bring the saxophone to the United States, which, of course, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but he was certainly an early ex exponent. His family band was called the Wright Saxophone Orchestra. This was in the 1920s. Yeah, Does that ring a bell? No, before my time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So tell me about some of your earliest musical memories. No, basically just, you know, playing with my father's band mm -hmm. because I had to do a lot of, you know, different things because we, sometimes he had a big band where we would have, you know, five brass, five saxes. Mm -hmm. Other times it would, we'd be working, you know, like an Elks Club or, you know, one of those kind of places and it would be like a small band. Sometimes it'd be him playing alto, my brother playing tenor. And then I would have to play third alto parts, you know. I'd have to transpose them, <laughs> you know. And I got to where I could, you know, I could sight read them, you know. Because wow. you got after, after a while, you know, it just automatically happens, you know. You just transpose it down a fifth, yeah. And it's like reading <laughs> regular part. <laughs> So, I, but I learned a lot, you know. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. preparation for arranging. Yeah, right. Ex you know, yeah. You you have to do that. I worked up up here. We used to work a Bradford Roof. Have to used to have a show thing they brought in. And I was working there with Harry DeAngelis and this conductor. It just we had three horns, and every night the conductor would come in and say. Sometime, some some tune, you say, oh, you know, oh, let's do this one in F tonight, you know, or let's do this one. <laughs> he would change key on something every single night. Every night you had to transpose something, you know, and the whole band did. Wow. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> you know, you kind of get used to it, so... So when you were growing up, did you play in, in um, school bands and orchestras? I played in, in high school mm -hmm. band. My first year there was like a waste. We had a guy that came in and talked about his troubles with his wife for about 40 minutes, and I said, oh, well, we better play something. <laughs> you play one piece and the period's over. Then we got a guy in called uh, Ralph Neer who really built the program. It was very, very good. And what and school was this? South High School. Uh-huh. Yeah. And he did a good job. We had ended up having a pretty good band. And I had a, you know, like a dance band it, within that thing. Oh. And, uh, that you ran as a high school yeah, student. Yeah, and we used to, uh, you know, play a few dances and things. We played old stocks, but the only music that was available at that time were stocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always had a trouble with, uh, you know, Mr. Near because he always ins kept telling me I had to play in the marching band, you know, for the football games and stuff, which were all on Friday night. I says, I can't do that because I work every Friday night. <laughs> he says, well, you have to do it or you can't be in the band and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And, and we used to go through that all the time. I said, oh, I just can't do it. Yeah. But needless to say, I ended up playing in the orchestra mm -hmm. and the dance band, and e everything but the marching band. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there was a concert band that you also played? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Regular high school yeah, band. Yeah, they had a concert band. He had a nice program, you mm -hmm. know. So he always looked the other way <laughs> with the marching band. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Were there any pieces that you played with the band that you remember, or any concerts that were memorable, or any experiences? Not, not really. I I know, you know, a couple of them I had to play some solos or something, but I have no idea what they mm -hmm. are now. You know, it was, you know, my memory's not great for those yeah, things. <laughs> right. You said you also played in the orchestra? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And what kind of stuff did they do? Was they it? were like, you know, light classical, mm -hmm. you know, uh, typical 
school things, you know, mm-hmm. things that weren't too hard, mm-hmm. you know. But mm-hmm. So growing up, did you listen to the radio much and hear music there that kind of influenced you? Not a lot. There wasn't a lot going on from that standpoint. I, we had a few records and things that I mm-hmm. listened to, and I listened to... Uh, Oh, the Washington D.C. band, uh, the disc jockey. What was his name? I can't think of his name right now. Bill Potts was on the band. Uh, uh, Washington D.C. Willis Conover. Oh yes. Yeah. Right. Listen, we had a an album of that band. Mm-hmm. Uh, with, I get the Swope Brothers, the trombone players, I mean, a lot of good players, and then Bill. Had done the album, uh, the Porgy and Bess album, that's kind of become a classic. So Bill Potts. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I actually met him years later down in Washington because they used to do clinics down there, and he was there. So. Wow. So it sounds like you were able to go to clubs and dance halls as a child when sometimes some of those places it, you know kids wouldn't normally be able to go with because your father. Well, we what we did mostly as a family. My father took us to concerts and things. Mm-hmm. You know, we used to be a place called Memorial Hall that brought people in, uh-huh. and we saw everybody from Spike Jones, who came in, to Fritz Chrysler. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. at the time, really. Yeah. You know, top. You know, classical mm-hmm. violin player. Mm-hmm. You know, so there are all kind of different things. Bands used to come into a place called the Deschler Wallach Hotel, and they had a room where they brought bands in. And that was the first time I saw Maynard. Uh, Maynard Ferguson. He yeah. was uh-huh. eighteen, <laughs> just came in from Canada. You know, to join. The, it was a Jimmy Dorsey band, and they featured on. Featured him on uh, Rhapsody in Blue hmm. at the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, you know, but they brought other bands in, you know, and mm-hmm. we generally went to see the bands. Uh, there was a skating rink on the east side that they used a big skating rink, and they had dances. Tommy Dorsey band came in, Gene Krupa band. Mm-hmm. We always, you know, got to see those things. Mm-hmm. Ellington and Basie too, or. Uh, I saw Ellington, I forget where, I think at an Air Force base someplace. That was later. Basie, I didn't see. Uh, there was a place down in Cincinnati called uh, Coney Island. They mm-hmm. brought bands in. Mm-hmm. Saw Stan Kenton down there. Mm-hmm. My brother and I went down. And then uh, several places, uh, Buckeye Lake, which yeah. is east of right uh, they had yeah. a, a dance hall there yeah yeah and they used to bring bands and we used to go out there all the time saw like ray anthony and you know all the bands at the time right so right. didn't go to many clubs uh-huh. uh, i did tell you i think the other day there was a black club in the south down in the south end right and they saw Nancy Wilson down there when she was, you know, very young. <laughs> Probably my age, <laughs> or close to it anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the first time I saw her. But oh. she was, like, local. Yeah. So. So I have some other names of some Columbus area um, jazz musicians. Um, this guy, Harry Sweets Edison, he was a trumpet player who played with Count Basie later on. Yeah, I and know. He, he, I know who he is, but I didn't know he. I didn't even know he's from Columbus. Uh-huh. To tell you the truth. Uh huh. What about somebody named Bobby um, Alston, a trumpet player? No. And I mentioned earlier Earl Hood, the Earl Hood Orchestra. Yeah. yeah. There was a keyboard player named Jimmy Carter. No. Um, a trombonist, Dippy Dyer. No. Um, had about an organist, Eddie Beard. <laughs> no. Or Eddie Nix, a drummer. No. No. One last, uh, Hank Marr. I think you said you knew uh, the, tr- the organist, Hank Marr. No, I don't think so. Oh, I thought you. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
And then there's some um, names of some groups, um, a group called the Keynotes of Rhythm Band. No. Or the Percy Lowry Orchestra. Yeah. No, I left, I don't know. These were pe people... Uh, Early on? Yeah. Yeah, because I, le I left when I was 21. I went mm -hmm. to service when I was yeah, 21. Yeah, these were like 40s and 50s. And so how about one more name of a group? Um, the Raleigh, R Raleigh Randolph Sultans of Swing? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a band that played up a place called the Valley Dale. I can't think of the name of the band. Yeah, but they a, were that popular. Was, that was a ballroom. Yeah. And, yeah. And that went yeah. for for a long time. How about the Macon Hotel? It was famous for its jazz for its jam sessions. The Macon Hotel? Yeah, M A C O N. No. And it's I don't even remember that. Yeah, I mentioned that it was famous for jam sessions. Mm. Um there was a place called the Palace Theater. Yeah, the Palace. Yeah. yeah or how about the Ogden Theater? No. Yeah. Any um, the theaters, Lowe's theaters or hotels that um, that you well, play? Well, the at? Lowe's Theater used to bring in a lot of shows. Mm -hmm. You know, live live shows. Palace did too. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the two main theaters that brought in live talent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were there shows at the Ohio Theater? Or was that was that? Yeah, the Ohio Theater yeah. brought in shows. I saw. Can't think of the guy's name, but Debbie Reynolds, mm -hmm. and who was she dancing? Eddie Fisher? No, 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 no. no dancing, uh, dancing guy. Very, very good, very popular. Can't think of his name. Mm -hmm. He was in the movie with her. So in the uh, there's an area in Columbus called the Near East Side that um, back in the in the 40s and 50s it was very much a, a black uh, neighborhood and it was a real haven of, of of jazz. Did you ever go down there for jam sessions or no? Uh huh. No. Uh huh. Yeah, it sounded like the um, in the in the 50s that Columbus was fairly fairly segregated and were there much opportunities for jazz musicians to to in intermingle that way and. Uh, well, when I saw Nancy, yeah. I mean, that was a black club, mm -hmm. and I had to be in my teens. Mm -hmm. So, and I think because it was music, you know, nobody, yeah, you know, musicians have always been kind of, you know, open about those things. Yeah. You know, yeah. you come to hear music, hey, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in those years, you know, there wasn't a lot of mixing. You know, that's what we were talking about earlier there with the, the Basie band and Duke's band. You know, I mean, the guys stayed for 30 years because they, you know, where are you going to work if you don't work with, or Lionel Hampton is another one. But, uh, you know, you kind of had to stay with those things if you wanted to play. Right, right. So, um... You spent some time in the U.S. Army in the the first armored division. Right? Yes, is that correct? And there was a band called the um, Old Ironsides Band. Is that the, 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 that's what I, I was reading up? And they they called the the band that played with the the first division Old Ironsides. Is that a late name that came later? I had never even heard the name before. Okay, maybe yeah. that's uh, a later thing. We were unique in that first armored division band was a jeep band. We played in jeeps. <laughs> wow. I never had to march. <laughs> <laughs> we had basically three guys to a jeep. A driver, and then somebody here, and then two guys in the back. And the jeeps were lined up, depending on streets, but either four or six jeeps across. Mm -hmm. And then, however many deep we had to go, I forget how many guys were in the band. But that's where we did parades, the jeep band, and it was good except if you got a bad driver, you know, because <laughs> the guy like lets the clutch out too fast. <laughs> you yeah, know, you're jerking like this all I'm the time, sure. you know. So it, it needed pretty good drivers. Oh. I know one time we were. Way down in Texas, I forget the t name of the town now. 
terrible with names, but uh, Lampasas, I think, whatever. But it was a long, long day. We did the parade, and you're driving home like at night, and the kid driving was falling asleep. You know, so I ended up driving home because <laughs> he just couldn't stay awake at all. But we did parades all over Texas mm-hmm. that way. Wow. You know, it was it was great. I don't remember the name Ironside Zone uh-huh. at all. So that might be a, a, a later thing after your, your could tour be. there. So when you joined the band, were you uh, um, were you planning to, to be a musician, or did they find out you played and had you play? No, no. Every opportunity I got when I, I got drafted, but every opportunity I got, I kept saying, you know, I want to be in the band. Mm-hmm. <laughs> were there auditions, or was it more kind of open? The, at the time? audition was. I was the last guy to to get into the band. Uh, I was like the last quota, uh, last guy. I had six weeks of basic training. hadn't touched a horn in six weeks. The master sergeant was a clarinet player. So I go in for an audition, and he puts a clarinet book in front of me. <laughs> I just, you know, so I can't play that because <laughs> you know it was way too high. <laughs> He said, no, 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 just play a little bit, play a little bit. So I did, you know, which was terrible because I didn't have any chops and the thing was out of range totally. I got in. <laughs> wow. He said, I want to see if you can read, you know, and that was it. So, but wow. when he gave, when I, you know, six weeks and he gave me a clarinet book, I said, oh, wow, I'll never make this one. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So while you were there in um, in, the, in the service, you organized a, a dance band. It was called the Dance Masters. Yeah, right? a friend of mine, a guy named Joe Solomon, and I. You know, there were there were different bands within the army band. You know, uh-huh. there was actually a society band, like what they called a tenor band. You know, three tenors and you know trumpet and trombone, which was very good. Uh, then we had the bigger band we called the Dance Masters. And we used to play this, you know, the Officers Club, the NCO Club, and the Service Club. You know, mm-hmm. used to do dances. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and, you know, that was good. So was it kind of big band um, dance music that you were doing, or was there something? Yeah, it was the same, same thing in those days. It was basically all stocks, you know, mm-hmm. the, what you buy, you know, out of the store. Mm-hmm. A couple of the guys in the band did some writing, you know. And in, in fact, that's for me, that was the best thing that happened. I've always been interested in writing, but could never, never had any structured study. And every book I ever bought, all they do is show you examples. And if you can figure out what they did, good. But if you don't have any background, you can't figure it out, mm. you know. And the amazing part is I still see those books. You know, a friend of mine came across the Glenn Miller book and he sent me a copy and it's the same thing. Hmm. It's here's like a two or four bar melody and you can do it this way or if you want to flush it out a bit you can do this. If you want to open it up and make it a little wider you can do this and this, you know. Never tell you what it is. You know, what are they doing? Mm. So. But you rectified in your books. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that used to frustrate me no end. And that's, in, in that band, that I, I read that that's where you got started um, in your interest in, in arranging. And well, I had the interest before, but uh-huh. what happened was I, I ran into two guys that were from up here this area, mm-hmm. who had gone to Berkeley. One was from Springfield, Vermont, a guy named Jack Carter, who's passed away now, and the other was George Jalbert from down around Hartford, Connecticut. And George and I are still in touch. We see each other occasionally and, you know, all. But they used to sit up in the day room with me. Yeah, we used to sit up like all night, and they were 
showing me this and showing me that, you know, and I was trying to write, you know, because you had the guys to play stuff. Right. So I was, I kept trying to write different things, and they'd show me different things. So, mm -hmm. and when I got out of the service, Jack came down from Springfield, Vermont, to show me around Berkeley. Took me introdu introduced me to Larry Burke, Bob Share, and all that. And that's where I ended up going to school. Mm -hmm. So, for me, it turned out to be, you know, really good. Right. Now you mentioned writing. Were you writing original tunes, or were you doing? No, I just trying to arrange things. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always. It's weird, but I've always been curious. You know, when I hear things, to know what they were. You know, and at that early age, didn't know what they were. Had no clue. You know, basically, but. Uh, I was always interested in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. Berkeley was a good school for me. So, it, um, and you mentioned um, at Berkeley you studied with this guy, f um, Fred Berman. I guess he played with the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, is that correct? Yeah, I think so, yeah. 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 Um, um, you want to anything else you want to say about, about Fred and kind of what, what you, you learned from him? And well, I wasn't with him that long. I was with him my first year up there mm -hmm. and then I got a I got a call from a friend of mine that I was in a service with to go on the road and I had the GI Bill you know and I was working some but I was still falling behind money wise <laughs> so and I didn't I really didn't want to ask my folks for money, you know. But it, it, I mean, at that time, I didn't start school till I was 23. At that point, I said, I, you know, I, I don't want to call home for money. <laughs> so I ended up going on the road for a year. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, Fred was gone. Mm -hmm. So what what show did you do on the road? Uh, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> I went out with a band called Leo Peepers. He was a territory band out of Chicago. And it's a mix, but it's kind of like a Lawrence Welk band. And you, you know, but da dip da dip da dip da dip you know, that, mm -hmm. that style band. And, you know, I get a really good lesson out of that one because I had never even heard that kind of music before. And when I got in the band, I was supposed to be lead trumpet player. There wasn't one single thing that was marked in the book, long or short. Not just notes. Mm -hmm. Nothing to tell you what style was. And I didn't know the style anyway. And you're the lead trumpet. If, if, oh, <laughs> oh, the first night was disastrous. I mean, disastrous. And after the job, Leo and Norm, Butler, the lead alto player who hired me was sitting at the table and Leo says, says gee he says Norm told me you could play <laughs> you know and he, I said Geez. you know Leo I can I said but I just you know don't know the style you know I mean, but it was a lesson never take anything you don't know what you're getting into and I've told that to other people but anyway we had a night off Norm took the book we came up to the hotel room went through the whole book you know uh, and from then on we were you know we were okay I stayed a year mm. on that band and I also wrote for the band at the time because mm -hmm. I'd been to Berkeley for a year and this was very simple music in fact there was not even Basically, a nine on a dominant seventh chord in the book. You know, <laughs> no, it's just basic change chord things. And when I started writing, I started putting in nines and flat nines. <laughs> and Leo's going, well, you know. <laughs> but he came around, you know, because it, it sounded good. So. But those were your first professional, really. Pers well, professional yeah, writing pretty for much. Yeah, group. yeah, yeah, just. You know, I wanted to learn to write the style. I mm. had the band, and I figured, why not? 
So, you know, we did that and, you know, then he had me, I wrote some things for the girl singer, you know, I just kept writing because I like to write anyway. Then he had me do Rock Around the Clock. <laughs> and we had two good jazz players on the band. A trumpet player was a good jazz player and a tenor player was a good jazz player. So gave him a couple of solos. And it, it was amazing because Leo loved it. And I wish I hadn't done it because we played it two or three times a night. <laughs> He'd always come back to it. Yeah. So anyway, that's, you know, kind of that story. Mm -hmm. wow. the, other, the other part of it is Norm is a joker. So when he called me, he wanted me to meet the band. It was in Kansas, but I think it was Topeka, I'm not sure. Anyway, reasonably small Kansas town. He says, check into, you know, this hotel, and we'll pick you up the next morning on the way through. And then he said, you know, if the hotel burns down or has burned down, just go to one that's close by. Because he, he was like a kind of a joker, you know, if the hotel burned down. Yeah, okay, you know. I got in there and the hotel had burned out. <laughs> it wasn't there anymore. <laughs> so I went to the next hotel, right? And I told the guy, you know, this is my name, you know, be sure I'm expecting a phone call. And every time I went in out of the hotel, I'd keep reminding the guy. So the whole day goes by and nobody calls me, you know, and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. That night I call home. And my mother says, you know, where are you? She says, they've been calling here all day long. <laughs> so anyway, we finally got together. They they had to play the job without me, come back and get me. And then, you know. But that was that whole thing was an experience and a half. <laughs> wow. So yeah. anyway. So there was this guy, John Coffey, a, a trombonist. I guess he had played bass trombone with the Boston Symphony. That yeah, John with John did a lot of things, yeah. Uh, he played, I think, something from Philly rings a bell with me, but I can't remember what he did. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, yeah, he was pretty well-known, you know, performer yeah. before he started teaching. So what are some things you learned from him? John's famous line was just tongue and blow, kid. <laughs> that was his, <laughs> that was John's thing, you know. Tongue and blow. You know, it's, you know. That's pretty much what I can tell you about yeah. John. <laughs> right. So you're working on just other, real, other real than that, basics. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Other, but other than that, he drank a lot. <laughs> oh. So, yeah. And then I mean, when you were at he, Berkeley, you also studied with um, Herb Pomeroy, right? I, yeah, not trumpet. I studied right. arranging. Herb and I came back at the same time. I was on Leo's band in '54. Came back to Berkeley in '55, and Herb came back at the same time. He was. He was either on Kenton's band or Lionel Hampton. I think it was Kenton yeah. at that time. Mm -hmm. And and when I got back in school, you know, they had me study with Herb privately, mm -hmm. as a, you know, as a private teacher. And you know, I played in his ensembles and you know all those things. With Herb, he used to, you know, he'd go in for a lesson and we'd be talking and he would say, oh, well, you know that. And I say, Herb, wait, you know, <laughs> I said, maybe I do and maybe I don't, you know, let's go through it, you know, because I always had to do that with him because he just, you know, because I'd been out playing and, you know, I'd done some writing. He's, oh, you know that, you know that. And you're the same age, too. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but 
at that point, you know, he had a lot more experience than I did, you know, especially from a writing standpoint. Yeah. So but at the time, what, what, what were some things that you really learned from him that, that made a difference for you? The one thing, you know, was like when he started the band. He asked myself and Bill Barry, who, you, you know who Bill is. I don't know. You don't know Bill. Yeah. Bill is a trumpet player. Hmm. He's from Cincinnati originally. Uh, but he went to L.A. He he played on the Merv Griffin show when they were in New York, and then he moved to L.A. when they moved out there. And he also ended up playing with Duke. That was his ambition to play with Duke, mm -hmm. and he made that. You know. Uh, but we were both students together. You know, we went after he went to school, same same years, same classes, all those things. Hmm. And Herb asked us both to play with the band. And playing with that band definitely is probably the best thing that ever happened to me because if you've, you've I guess you haven't, but playing with Herb, he got the most out of everybody I ever saw, man. Every band he ever had, we used to do clinics together in Indiana and Illinois. And he just managed to, he'd teach kind of like without teaching, you know. I mean, if you listen to what he said, you know, he just really learned how to play. Mm -hmm. Are there some specific examples of things you remember that learning that, that made a difference for you? No, just from a playing standpoint. It, it, and at that level, you know, and we could play. We, we were all decent players at the time. But it was always the little things that count, that that clean up things. You know, like you talk about separations and, talk, you know, just I've, I've known him with his band, which was a really good band. I've known him to pull a chart out just to talk about I want this eighth note longer. You know, literally he did that one day at rehearsal. <laughs> Pull this out, okay, I, you know, this eighth note I want to be longer. The only thing he fixed on the whole chart, you know, was that. But it was, a, you know, attention to detail, just basically how to play. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the band had, you know, excellent time. It just, we play one night, Jimmy Zatano was late, you know, the drummer, mm -hmm. playing the stables. And we played without him. It was just John Nevs on bass and mm -hmm. Muzzy on piano. Playing a chart called Why Not, which I just actually redid about a week ago. Hmm. Uh, it was a bright, that kind of thing. Man. I was never so impressed with anything in my life when we played that. That thing absolutely romped from beginning to end mm. and no drummer. <laughs> and the time was impeccable. You know, that, that has always impressed me mm. with that band. So. When you were but at Berkeley, was um, Joseph Schillinger's theory still taught? The first year I was there, yeah. Uh -huh. When when I left to go on the road and came back, they had gotten rid of it. Mm -hmm. It just became. He got Larry got tired of one thing. He got tired of paying the estate for the use of the name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing was like nobody understood it. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, even even the people who were supposed to be teaching it, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like really out in the left field. Mm -hmm. You know, as an approach, it's like a mathematical approach to right. writing or something. You know, it's too mechanical and too complicated. It has some good things in it, you know, naturally. But uh, you know, the one thing I always remember is geometric inversion. You know, where you 
can take the melody that you're writing and turn it upside down and you can write it backwards and you know <laughs> and, and it creates another melody supposedly you know but all those things mm-hmm. yeah so, I don't think it's practical yeah you know so you, did uh, I have here that you graduated from Berkeley in 1957 is that right yes yeah um, and then soon after that you joined the Woody Herman band is that correct yeah how did that come yeah. about uh, again, playing with Herb's band, you know, all the bands that came to town, the Storyville used to be right across the street from Stables mm-hmm. at the Copley Hotel, not the Copley Plaza, but the Copley Hotel. Mm-hmm. And every time they'd get a break, they would run over to hear the band, you know, and they brought different bands, and Basie was in, Woody was in, uh... And the lead trumpet player, John Coppola, with Woody, had been on Kenton's band with Herb. Hmm. So they were good friends, you know, and I met John through Herb. And at the time, they had a trumpet player on the band who was really a juicer. I mean, he would, they were riding in cars, and he would get out of it and actually take a car and disappear for a week (laughs) or two with one of the band cars. <laughs> so they finally were going to get rid of him. And at the time, they were working several places around town. And they asked me to sub, John asked me to sub up at Old Orchard Beach one night. And sub on lead? Huh? Sub on lead? No. It, but it ended up that way. Mm. But I was supposed to take Bill's. Bill, I didn't want his chair because he had the high note chair. You know, go out in front of the band and play the high notes. And I didn't want to do that. But the night I subbed, John kept giving me lead parts all night long. And I said, John, come on, I just want to play with the band and have a good time and relax. You know, he said, no, no, no. So I want Woody to hear you. And well, you know, so anyway, they decided to make a change and they offered me, you know, the chair. But as it turned out, it was the high note chair, which I got stuck with. So anyway, I, I subbed some someplace else again, and they offered me the job. And at the time, the pay was a hundred and fifty dollars, you know. And the manager's the one to talk to me, not not Woody or you know anybody. It was the manager, and he was offering me a hundred and a half. And I said, you know, I said, love the guys, but I just I can't do it for that, you know, because I make them more money in town, you know, without travel anyway. And I, he went over to talk to Woody. who was sitting at a we were we were in a a bar someplace after the job, and I heard Woody say, you know, pay him. <laughs> So they offered me 175, and I took it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So. so that would have been 175, like per service or something. No, a week. per week. A week. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, at those days it wasn't that bad. Was, that was yeah. You, that was, you talk about the Leo Peepers band. I, the pay on that, that band was 85 dollars a week. I saved money. Those days, a meal was a buck and a half. Hotels were three dollars, and we only checked in every other night because they had what they called the day sheet. You could check in any time from six in the morning. Hmm. So we would, if we checked in a hotel, we'd play the job, maybe drive to the next town, which was always two or three hundred miles. Hmm. Get in in the morning, check in, stay play the job, come back to the hotel, and the next night you would skip checking in. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. You would. You only checked in every other night. So you'd sleep twice for the price of one, you know. You can't do that anymore. No. Yeah. But all kind of things. But I save money, $85 a week, and I save money. That's great. Wow. So. So what are some of your notable memories of playing with the uh, Woody Herman Band? My first one was great. 
disappointment. After coming off Herb's band, Woody's band sounded like a high school band to me. <laughs> hmm. It was so different. It was unbelievable. And then on top of that, you had all the personality nonsense going on, which we never had. You know, I never had that with anybody, you know, in Boston. Trumpet players weren't talking to each other, you know, and they had two. I got stuck, I told you, on the high note book, which I didn't like, but they had a couple of guys that would take some lead parts and get to the out chorus and not be able to make it through. You know, just, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the band's playing and there's no lead trumpet going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the charts were windy, you know, but they still took them anyway. And, you know, just all kind of things going on that I wasn't used to. The really good thing about it was Bill Harris was on the band. And I ended up riding with Bill hmm. in the car. And to hear him play every night was a joy. Mm -hmm. But I he had what instrument did he play? Trombone. Okay. He had a good, you know, jazz trombone mm -hmm. player. So the thing with that was <laughs> the drummer was Carl Kiffey, who was a child prodigy. And he and Bill didn't get along. Bill would say, he, he, and very politely ask him, he said, look, you know, when I'm playing, like, you know, just play time, you know. And he didn't want him dropping bomb, you know. And then Carl would say, well, who's he think? He can't tell me how to play, you know. And Bill would be playing, and Carl would be dropping bombs, you know. <laughs> this went on all the time, mm. you know. I mean, all the things that are non-musical, you know, all the, all the nonsense. So that was very disappointing. The book was good to play, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that part of it, mm -hmm. you know. Did you write any arrangements for the group? No, mm -hmm. I didn't write for that band. Uh, talk about money, the saxophone players making a bill and a quarter a week. He had saxophone players lined up like forever wanting to go on the band. You know, the three tenor thing, mm -hmm. you know. So he didn't have to pay any money to tenor players. Jed Migliari was on the band. Uh, this is the period before Getz and the, the guys were in, I think. No, right? after. After the period. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, after, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but, uh, you know, some good tenor players. Roger Pembleton was playing uh, baritone. Joe Romano was on the band at one point. You know, but they weren't making any money. <laughs> they just doing it because, you know, they wanted to play with Woody. Mm -hmm. So it had its good points and its, you know, bad points. Mm -hmm. You know, but mm -hmm. the initial thing was kind of a shock because yeah. I expected it to be better. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that happened with that was, at least ten or f ten, twelve years later, I subbed on the band up here. They needed somebody for a night to call me, playing Paul's Mall. Remember the jazz club, Paul's Mall? That's before no. my time. Heard of it. Yeah, it was on Boylston Street. I subbed. First tune they played was The Preacher. And I, Paul Fontaine was on the band. I said to Paul, I said, Paul, I said, you won't believe this. I said, but it feels like I never left the band because we played it every... When I was on the band, I played it all the time. And then to play the first tune as a sub, it really felt like I hadn't, <laughs> hadn't mm. left the band. <laughs> so uh, after that, we played some other things I hadn't seen before. Right. So, you know, hey, all right. Hi, I have one more question about Woody Herman. Um, what was he like as a leader, as a band leader? Woody was good. Uh... I remember when I first <laughs> went on the band, I don't, I don't know where we were. I, I joined a band in Indiana at the Indiana Roof. It was one of my first jobs. Uh, 
but we were at a bar someplace, and I was talking to Woody, and I kind of asked him why, after all these years, he was still doing one nighters, because I was on the I was on the band for a year, and we did one nighters every single night, and the only time I had a night off was to travel a thousand miles. If we were on a long trip, we'd have the night off. Other than that, we worked every night. And he said, I like it. <laughs> so, you know, why he wanted to stay doing it that long, but he he did it long after I left the band. Mm -hmm. So he, he really liked what he was doing. And he was good leader. The only time he was the least bit bad, and it was very rare, was if he, you know, juiced a little bit too much. You know, he could kind of change personality a little bit. Other than that, he was good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Musically, you tell me about him as a as a leader. Woody had, and I I didn't agree with it when I first went on the band. But Woody had a knack. We very rarely had a rehearsal. The only time we ha had close to a rehearsal was new charts came in. He had a knack of taking a chart and changing it. We'd play it down. Number one, we'd play it down. If he didn't like it, pass it in. It, it was no give it a chance or anything. No, if he didn't like it, pass it in. If we were going to do it, he would switch it around. He would say, okay, you know, play the intro in letter A and then jump to D and then go back to B, and he would kind of change the form of the chart. And almost invariably, it was better. <laughs> he just had that kind of a knack, you know, for structure, doing things that, you know, made the chart actually stronger than it was. Mm -hmm. So, but as a leader, he was good. Mm -hmm. He was no trouble. So what would account for, you were talking about you know, the difference when you joined, uh, coming from Herb's band, you are saying that you, you felt like the, the quality was very different, but yet he was uh, the, well regarded the, the, the trouble with that was like personalities, you know, and I, you know, I think from his standpoint, he, you know, he'd been through that, you know, for years and years and years, you know, with different personalities, so he, I think he just ignored it all, mm -hmm. you know and just didn't pay any attention to it. But it's, from a musical standpoint, you know, he was good. The band sounded good, you know. I mean, they had some, certainly in the trumpet section, there were some problems, uh, more than any other section, I think, you know, by far. But when I was on the band, it was uh, John Coppola, myself, Bill Berry, who all got along fine. Uh, Danny Styles was on the band. I mean, you know Danny or not? He again was on the Merv Griffin show, and mm -hmm. you know, good trumpet player around New York. And a guy named Andy Peel. And mostly it was Danny and and Andy who were, you know, kind of disruptive. And also they had their wives with them, and the wives didn't get along. You know, a typical. It's <laughs> just basically those kind of problems. I think Woody just doesn't pay any attention anymore at all. You know, right. he doesn't want to know about it. So. So after your tour with the Herman Band, you taught at the yeah. Berkeley School of Music. Um, what years was was that? Uh, I was on Woody's band for a year. So it would probably be like late, probably the fall of '58. Mm -hmm. uh, to 1963. Mm -hmm. And you taught theory and, and, and you were an ensemble. Yeah, I taught arranging and, yeah. and had the ensembles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any memorable students that you had at that that you remember? Uh, at some point, I had Gary Burton. Oh my! Yeah, wow. <laughs> at 18, <laughs> <laughs> who, you know had better ears than anybody <laughs> around. 
there were a couple of people. There was actually there was a bass player. I was telling somebody the other night. Uh, that came in one day. He wasn't a good student. And he came in one day and says, I'm leaving school. He says, I'm, I'm going to New York. And just having me as a student, I, I thought to myself, oh, Jesus, you know, here's another kid that, you know, is going to go down to New York and get eaten alive, you know, because he, he was really not a good student. And he did. He left, went down. Next time I saw him, he came into Monticello playing bass for Tony Bennett. <laughs> but he's, he didn't belong in school because he wasn't interested in writing. He wasn't, you know, and that's what Berkeley is, is pretty much a writing school. You know, so... He went down, he did the right thing. You know, he quit school, didn't belong there, went down, got himself a good teacher, learned how to play, and, you know, he's one of the best bass players in New York. So, but you never know about people as far as, you know, you gotta find out what you really wanna do, you know, and then do it. And I've said for years, everybody doesn't belong in college. I think there's an awful lot of money wasted there for people that don't know what they want to do yet. So, uh, I don't know, I can't, I'm trying to think of names again and I can't. But I've had an awful lot of people that are professional, mm -hmm. working, even around town here, you know. I've got people that play with me that I had in school, you know, that you know, have done very well. So when you were back at Berkeley, then you were playing with Herb Pomeroy's band again? Yeah, I got back on the band again. I didn't think I would, but I somehow got back on the band again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. who were some of the other bands you were playing with at the time? Local? Yeah. Uh, at some point, I used to work a lot with Ted Herbert out of Manchester, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. In fact, Ted when I was going to school, put me through school pretty much, you know, because mm -hmm. he was working about three nights a week. Mm. We'd always do. Some of them were horrendous distance. <laughs> we used to work, I never forget, we used to work Burlington, Vermont once a year. And that was before there were any highways. <laughs> 89 didn't exist. <laughs> mm. <laughs> we used to leave at nine o'clock in the morning and it wasn't like an eight-hour drive. Mm. Play a four-hour job, turn around and come back mm. the same night, and I would get back in time to go to class the next morning. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was a that was a terrible trip, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but when you're young, it doesn't matter. You know, you don't even think about it. Right. So. Right. Any other groups at the time you were playing with that you want to talk about? Uh, uh no there were just I usually play with bands. Uh there were three bands that worked all the time. Uh Ted a guy named Freddie Soterial mm -hmm. and then Bob Batchelor mm -hmm. who ended up working the totem pole steady for a, quite a while. And I used to sub on those bands uh at different times. You know, mm -hmm. sub with Freddie once in a while and with Bob once in a while. Uh, Herb used to have work. Herb used to subcontract. When the bands came to town, they would pick up local players. Uh, the Jimmy Dorsey band with uh, Lee Castle. Uh, Warren Covington used to come up all the time. Mm -hmm. Used to do some things with... Uh, oh, come on. I know as well as I know my name. Accordion player with Lawrence Welk. I don't know. Oh, come on. I, I do, because I, I used to love him. He's really a gentleman, really nicest man in the world. Myron Florin. Oh, okay. Yeah, Myron used to come up and do things down at the Cape. And we used to do those all the time. Uh, and different things like that. 
People mm-hmm. that come to town, we did Steve and Edie all the time. Did, uh, well, Nancy Wilson when she came to town. Also did Sinatra twice at Symphony Hall. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tony Bennett, you know, mm-hmm. th- those kind of people. Mm-hmm. You know, it would be extra work. Mm-hmm. So, did Pearl Bailey. Uh-huh. Uh, at one point with Louie. Yeah, Louie so, so. was with her that time. Oh. So. so you played this um, gig with the uh, Pomeroy Band at the, the Birdland Jazz Club in New York. Yeah. Um, anything you want to say about that? I guess they did some of your arrangements there, right? Yeah, we, well, that's when we did recording. Life uh-huh. is a Many Splendid Gig. Mm-hmm. Uh, the band played Birdland and then we recorded while we were there. Uh, Not so much about Birdland, you know, it was a typical club as far as, you know, clubs go. Mm-hmm. But we did do the recording there mm-hmm. uh, for Roulette. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that is, you know, to my mind anyway, you know, the best band I've ever played with at, at that particular time, mm-hmm. you know. There were later bands and so on and so forth, but I think that band was, you know, as good as it gets for me. Mm-hmm. So. So in March of 1958, there was a concert by the um, Her Pomeroy Band in Kresge Auditorium, um, and it was an event called Living History of Jazz, and there was a commentary by John McLellan, who had a jazz program on WHDH called Top Shelf. Yeah. Do you remember that gig and kind of what that was about? I'm not sure I remember the the gig itself. Uh, but we did that history of jazz thing different places, you know, sometimes in schools uh, and as a concert type, type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know who put it better get put it together, whether John did, uh, well, it's a combination of John and her probably, but uh, there was somebody else, a guy named Irving Swartz, who used to be in education a lot, and he was into history type things. I know we did, we did a lot of concerts through him hmm. at schools. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that was the same thing or not, or, yeah. you know, a different you know, a different history program or not. Right. And then yeah. there was something on um, Channel 2 called the Jazz Ed- Educational Series. Was that related at all, or was that a different thing? That was different, I think. And did you play, for, were you involved with that thing? I did, well, I did the, yeah. I can't remember, you know, dates or anything. I also did it with a couple of other bands. One other band was uh, Joe McDonald's band. He had a band. We did a couple of things with him. We did some concerts in the Boston Garden, not the Boston Garden, Boston Common. They had some programs down there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I played with Joe. They had Jimmy Rushing in one year, I know. We played Jimmy, Hmm. uh, which was great. You know, that, you know, talk about being enthusiastic. My God. He was something else. So you had done a tour with um, the Sammy Donahue, Tommy Dorso Orchestra from 63 to 66, and then you came to um, Boston Conservatory. Um, yeah. How did you get the, the the teaching job there? A friend of mine was, I think he was dean at the time. He did become president. But he... And who was this? Well, George was a... George and I taught at Berkeley together. George, what's his name? George last? Brambilla. Uh huh. We taught at Berkeley together. Pretty close. In fact, we ended up teaching all of arranging for the first two years. You know, two two full years of arranging. Mm-hmm. And we got along really well, and we had the same views on everything as far as teaching and what we were teaching. And it worked out really well because it, somebody could have me one semester and then get George the next, and it would be a continuation. 
it wouldn't be okay forget all that and start here again you know it it just we had the thing down together where you know it became continuous as far as teaching and he went over to the conservatory became dean and i was back in town one time and he asked me you know to teach arranging because he wanted to start a program at, at the conservatory and I just uh, George you know I'd love to but I would you know I don't want to quit the band yet because we were just going overseas a lot and I wanted to do that and he said no no that's fine he says I'll do it till you get back you know when whenever you want to come back you know you got a job so <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about when I quit the band what I was going to do. Mm. You know, I was going to be teaching. But the uh, funny part about the band, I had been teaching at Berkeley in 63. And a show came in, Broadway show came in, with a week of rehearsal. The week of rehearsal was the first week of school at Berkeley. You know, start of a semester it was in September, and you know I went to Larry. Usually they say fine, you know, if you're working, they want you to work. For some reason, he just said, "Oh no, it's the first week of school." You, you know, and I said, "You know, Larry, I, I, I have to do this because if I don't take it, somebody else will, and I'm out." You know, because once you don't take a show they'll get somebody and they won't call you again because the next show comes in they'll just say to the guy you want to do the next one and you know so <laughs> anyway we went back and forth I offered makeup classes I said look I can make them up during the semester no problem because you do that all the time you know you have to take a day off or something you make up the class no everything was no and then I offered, you know, subs, you know, I said, I'll, I'll get, you know, so-and-so to take the week for me, the class, you know, so. no, everything was no, and, and the weird part is, I offered everybody I could think of except one guy who was just fired this semester before, Dick Wright, who was a great writer, so anyway. I offered everybody but Dick. <clears throat> they, <laughs> it finally came down to it. Larry said, hey, make up your mind. You know, he says, you do one or the other. And I said, okay. I said, I'm going to take the theater because I don't want to quit playing. I want to play, you know. So he said, okay. So number one, they hired Dick Wright back. <laughs> And I had offered everybody but him because I figured they're not going to take Dick. And the show canceled. <laughs> so I'm out of work totally. <laughs> and now it's funny. Then it wasn't so funny. <laughs> but when I look back on it, I just, geez, it's really ridiculous. Anyway, that's when I went on the Dorsey Band. Hmm. They were up at Blinstrup's. I went out to see some people I know, and they were going to Europe. And I said, a couple of guys, I said, oh, Jesus, you know, I'd love to go to Europe. I'm, nobody's going to quit before Europe, right? A couple of weeks later, I got a call from Sam. He says, I hear you might be interested in going out. And I said, yeah. <laughs> he says, I got a trumpet player I'm not happy with. He says, if you'll, if you'll commit to it, he says, you know, we'll do it. I said, fine. That's how it, but I ex expected to quit after three months. Figured I'd go to Europe, come back. You know, I didn't want to go on the road again. I stayed three years because every time I, every time I turned around, we were going someplace. Came back from Europe, went to South, went to uh, Puerto Rico for two weeks. Then they're going to Japan. Come back from Japan, we're going to South America. You know, come back from South America, we're going to Japan again. You know, it just, 
and we're doing good work. Did all the TV shows, did Ed Sullivan, mm -hmm. Johnny Carson, Mike Douglas, all the TV shows, all extra money every time. Did recordings in between. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's that mm -hmm. thing. But being out of a job <laughs> mm -hmm. wasn't pleasant at the time. Uh -huh. And then you came and you were at Boston Conservatory, and um, and Fred Harris was a student of yours at, yep. at some point. So. Yeah. Um, what um, what what courses did he take from you? He took arranging, and he played in the in the band. Uh -huh. Any yeah. comments about him as a as a student? That oh, you he's remember? terrible. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, no. Fred was always good. You mm -hmm. know, he's you know like he is now, conscientious. Yeah. You know, takes care of business, yeah. and that's, you know, in this business, that's priority. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, tell me about how you got hired at at, at MIT by um, Herb Palmer. When Herb started the program, they they contacted him, and you know, and he told me when they first contacted him, he, you know wasn't really sure he wanted to do it. Uh, and I think part of it was probably because of the level that he thought he was going to get. Mm -hmm. You know, part-time players, uh, you know, not mainly music students, you know, so. But just in general, he wasn't sure he wanted to do it one way or the other. Uh, but he ended up doing it. And what happened was he had they only had one band, and he had to turn so many people down. He auditioned everybody, and then just, you know, took the best players, which is what you always do. And he had so many left over that were good players, but if they didn't get in the band, they weren't available, you know, a year later or two years later when he needed somebody, they weren't there, you know. so. He was turning so many people away, he decided to start, you know, like a feeder band. So that when somebody did leave, you know, he would have people to choose from that mm -hmm. had been playing, you know, and still interested in it. Right. So he just kept it going. And, you know, basically the reason he hired me or recommended me or whatever, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier, just walking over here, but I am not necessarily jazz orientated. You know, my everything I've ever done is, you know, oh, I play with bands, and some of the bands are jazz bands, and, you know, but I'm not a jazz player. I'm more, and he, and he Herb told me this, he's the reason he hired me was, because I could teach, you know, mechanics of playing, you know, and get the people, teach them what they needed to know to get to the next level. So, that's basically the reason. Mm -hmm. So, um, tell me just a little bit more about kind of your role and how you uh, worked with, with Herb on that, you must have talked about kind of a musical vision for kind of what you were doing and and how it it worked with him. We, from my being with him, I'm sorry. Over the years, you know, and we we did. I mentioned we did clinics. We did the Stan Kenton clinics in uh, Illinois, Indiana, uh, Connecticut for a number of years, and Herb and I would always audition the brass players. And from me playing with a band and, you know, just being close friends all the time, we had the same approach to things. So he definitely knew where I was coming from, you know, and I knew what he wanted and what he's looking for. And we were just kind of on this. It was kind of like George Rambello and I with the arranging thing. We were on the same page, mm. you know. So it just 
one of those things that worked out well mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. When you were um, at MIT with, with, with Herb, did you ever get a chance to work with, with his band? Uh, I rehearsed the band a couple of times when he couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, basically, no, just just as a sub once in a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My my stuff was mostly with the second band. Mm -hmm. So tell me about working with um, MIT students. And um, I mean, as we, as we know, most of these students aren't music students. Um, but um, do you have any comment about working with them? And because um, you've also worked with you know conservatory students. And yeah, the the big difference for me was with the MIT people. I mean, they didn't have sometimes the technique that a major music student had. You know, if that's just major, you know, they're pretty good technique wise and all this stuff. The big difference for me was when I told them something. I only had to tell them once. And I couldn't do it all the time because maybe they didn't have the technique to do it all the time. But they understood it. Whereas with other people, you have to tell them, you know, you have to keep harping over and over and over again. You know, do this, do this, do this. <laughs> MIT is different. You know, they really get it the first time around most of the time. Mm -hmm. you know. Can't always do it maybe physically because of technique or whatever, but they understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to keep repeating it over and over. Right. You know, so that was a big difference I noticed with them. Mm -hmm. and, and you must have had some, some good players to, to work with who actually had some good techniques. Oh, yeah, yeah they the were good too. players, yeah. 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 Yeah, for part-time players, you know, we played some hard music over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, you know, you didn't water it down necessarily. Right. You know, you might have some problems range-wise trumpet or this or that, you know, and, and a lot of times it, I'd be playing something, maybe to have a high F on the end of the piece and, you know, I mean, I would say to them, hey, so we'll make high C the high note. There's just not one person in the audience that knows what that's supposed to be. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, they don't know the difference, mm -hmm. and it sounds just as good. You know, mm -hmm. it's just a different ending note. Mm -hmm. So you could adjust things as you went. Yeah. Any particular charts you remember doing that that you you particularly enjoyed working with them on? No, over the years we played an awful lot of music. You know, but I I would try to pick things. You know, for the band I had mm -hmm. that particular year. You know, How would you yeah. describe the the repertoire? Uh, kind of what what you because it was you seemed like you had a particular kind of focus to the repertoire you were teaching them. I I played as opposed to the first band, which you know played certainly more progressive music. I played more middle of the road things that I could teach them how to play things. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, when I say straight ahead or middle of the road, it's, you know, pretty straight up and down music. It's mm -hmm. not busy music, although, you know, some of the things are noty when you get into them, but, but they were things that you could teach people collectively how to play. Mm -hmm. When you play some of the busy things, there's so many lines going on, you can't talk about Collectively, you can't say, okay, this should be short, that could be long, you know, and and separate here and all those things. Mm -hmm. So I, I basically tried to do things that I could teach how to play mm -hmm. in a band. Mm -hmm. You seem to have an affinity for certain kind of blues charts. Um, is Was that just something I, I'm misreading or something? But it's... it's yeah, you know... Uh, a lot of the jazz material is blues. Mm -hmm. I, mean, you know, I just wondered blues, if that blues was Blues changes, no, well, no, just, you know, I think I played a variety of things, you know, mm -hmm. played some, you know, a lot of Bill Holman things, with a lot of lines in them and things. Mm -hmm. He really wrote a lot of unison things. Uh, any, I tried any, to play different people. Yeah, any bebop charts? Over the years, no. Mm-hmm. 
Not very many. Mm -hmm. no, I can't even think of any right now yeah. with that band. Mm -hmm. Did any yeah. of the students write, do any arrangements for the group? Had a couple of people write. I'm trying to, I know we did. I, I can't remember who they were, though. Uh, I know we did a thing was an original that Charlie Marge played, uh, oh. the tenor player mm -hmm. yeah. and clarinet player. He played clarinet on this, and I know we went down to Connecticut to play, and I mean, he did a nice job on it, and they racked him something terrible, you know, with critique. You mean you went to a festival? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I forget who it was. It was an alto player, Cannonball or somebody. And they just racked him terrible, you know. I mean, and I, I, I was upset. I know Herb was extremely upset. <laughs> yeah, but that was an original piece that somebody had done, you know, mm. for the band. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a few, not not a lot though, but a few people write. Mm -hmm. Was your experience with um, the the group that some of the students or many? Uh, some of them new to jazz, and you were kind of teaching them kind of basic things about Oh, about I think that. they all came out of some kind of music program in school, uh -huh. you know, so they wanted to continue playing. But would you, would you get anybody who was, say, a classical player who was interested in jazz but didn't know how to play? Was that not? No, not too much, because mm -hmm. you ended up auditioning everybody mm -hmm. to get in. Mm -hmm. I've had times when, you know, I've had some flute players that wanted to play with the jazz band. I had a couple of French horn players that wanted to play uh, that I used, actually, and I would scratch out some, you know, some French horn parts for them to play. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally speaking, not too many. Right. You know. right. Yeah. So looking back at some, some old concert programs, you often did um, performed with uh, the Festival Jazz Ensemble, but also other area um, colleges, you know, like Harvard and University of Lowell and uh, Westfield State College and Brandeis. And yeah, we had a, they had a series going where one of the concerts, we would invite two other bands in. It would be both MIT bands and then two other bands. It would be Harvard, like you say, Harvard, BU sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, each band would play approximately 20, 25 minutes. And that was just, you know, to give other bands a place to play also right. as much as anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, We did that for several years. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was one time I had my, I was teaching up at Lowell at the same time and I brought my Lowell band down. So I had two bands going that night. <laughs> so. Hmm. So tell me about um, rehearsing with the, um, the, the the concert jazz band. You were telling me you rehearsed on Sunday mornings. <laughs> yeah, Sunday mornings and Saturday mornings uh -huh. uh, were the two times uh, mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was working at Monticello, I remember doing Sundays because we would do ten to one. I would go out to the club, have a three o'clock show and then an eight o'clock show on Sundays. You know, that ended up being a long day. Mm -hmm. But it was, for some reason, it was the only thing available at the time. Other times I was working the theater and have to do the same type of thing with matinees on Saturday. You know, I'd have a Saturday matinee. So I'd end up doing Sunday morning, 10 to one, and running down to the theater for two o'clock show. And, no, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seemed to be the logical time to do it was on the weekend, as far as they were concerned, because you had people that, you know, always couldn't make the times. Right. And room availability, also. So how many concerts a semester did you usually do? I mean, I'm... We did uh, two, I think, for the year. We did one... One, we do one in December or something, and then one in spring. Right, that's what I'm finding I, with back programs. I just wondered if, that, if yeah. I was missing anything. Yeah, we did two, I think, as mm -hmm. far as mm -hmm. over the years go. Yeah. 
So after Herd Pomeroy left MIT, uh, the band was taken over by Jamshid Sharifi, who had been a former MIT student, class of 83. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like working with him? Uh, quite a different musician, to say the least. Uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't have a lot of contact with him. Uh, the purpose was the same, you know, to mm -hmm. move people up mm -hmm. when when... There were vacancies, right? You know. And you did auditions together and stuff like that. So you had to, yeah, kind of, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Any any thoughts about um, Jam Shade um, and him as a, as a musician? And no, well, he was, you know, different musically. You mm -hmm. know, he's he did a lot of writing, right. uh, you know, of his own things. You know, which I guess he studied, you know, at Berkeley with her. Right. Uh, I didn't know him that well as far as other than MIT and then we rehearsed on different days so I actually didn't run into him that much mm -hmm. except for concert things and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. but he certainly carried the music on in the direction that Herb was going you know because when I first met Herb years ago everything was bassy you know, we used to run over to Storyville to see Basie all the time. And then he got into Duke, you know, and then became Duke Ellington. And then he, you know, even with his band, it, it progressed, you know, certainly to more contemporary music. That last album we that I did was Promlotta's Hips with, you know, a lot of John Laporta things and, you know, Time changes and and all those things and and jam she was into those things too so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. so then um jam she left in nineteen ninety two and um James O'Dell and was we know him as by jim um came did you know Jim before that uh just vaguely from the b u band because mm -hmm. he used to be at b u right uh it's one of you done any gigs with him or anything like no, that? No, no. Well, he was a tuba player. Because mm -hmm. so. he had done some jazz playing around. And I yeah, wondered. but I, I hadn't run into him other than the the BU thing. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts of d d um, working with him here at MIT or any thoughts about that? No, pretty much the same thing. You know, we're all on different schedules. Mm -hmm. So other than auditions and concerts about the only time I saw him. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So Jim had um, established uh, the what was called the New England Collegiate Jazz Festival, which ran for nine years. Did the MIT Concert Jazz Band participate in that at all? I didn't, I didn't play that, no. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I didn't find um, your group listed, and I just wondered if um, something got, got missed or something. No. Uh-huh. Um, so um, tell me about um, what um, came, how it came about that the, the MIT Concert Jazz Band stopped, and and, and what was did you the only thing I got was budget cuts. Mm -hmm. They went through supposedly, mm -hmm. you know. I, I don't know, just but it was a time when. Everybody was cutting back, mm -hmm. you know, all the schools and and everything, and they decided to not have the second band. Mm -hmm. And it was not because of lack of interest as far as number of students. Uh, in no, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. So the last um, concert um, that I find in the, that you had done was May twelfth, nineteen ninety five. Um, does that sound right? It could. I tell you, I'm, I'm uh -huh. terrible with dates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, because looking at the concert program for the fall of 95, then it was just a festival jazz ensemble. Yeah, okay. Just that's, that's probably right. Yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts about working at MIT and with students and just the experience of being here? And I always found, for the most part, you know, everything to be as far as MIT goes very professional 
when I used to come in, and I I can't remember his name. There used to be a custodian, you know, that would set up, you know, come in and get the room ready, and, and I mean, he he was absolutely great, you know, anything. You know, you, you never had to look for it. They had the piano out and unlocked, and you know, everything was done professionally. You know, it was like no no chasing anybody to find keys and this and that. He'd have the band room unlocked and, you know, all those things, you know. And the students have always been good. I've had a couple of people over the years, you know, that they would have overlapping things, you know, like in the morning, guy come in late, oh, you know, I, whatever, I had baseball or I had one guy, I had Frisbee, I couldn't come, you know, I was late for here because I had Frisbee, you know, some whatever, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> but I used to tell him, I said, look, you know, I need you here for rehearsal. I said, now you, all you have to do is make up your mind which you want to do most. And I said, whatever that is, that's fine with me. I I'm, don't want to press you in anything, you, whatever you want to do. I said, but you can only do so much. You can't do everything, you know. So outside of a few things like that where, you know, I mean, the kid, he wants to do this, he wants to do this, he wants to do something else. Hey, if they all meet at the same time, you can't. So, mm -hmm. but outside of that, you know, and that was, wasn't really a problem in, in that, you know, I'm mad at somebody or something, you know, it's just make up your mind. Mm -hmm. That's life, you know, right. <laughs> you can't do everything. Right. Mm -hmm. There was a jazz clarinet player at MIT um, who was professor of English, Roy Lamson. Did you ever play with him? I know the name. Uh huh. He was a no, well regarded jazz trump, um, jazz. Um, Clarinet player. Is it clarinet player? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, oh. Yeah, okay. I, people say that he knew all the tunes in the book, you know, the standard. Yeah. You know, I wondered if you'd. Had, no, had I know the name. I yeah. have heard the name. I don't know him. Yeah. What about a, um, a piano and vibraphone player, Warren Rosenau? No. Uh huh. Um, so you've worked with um, Professor Samuel J. Kaiser, a, a jazz trombonist <laughs> who's a. Um, um, Professor Emeritus, you know, in the linguistics department yep. here. Tell me about working with Jay. He played with you in the, the, the concert jazz band for a number of years, and how that came about. Yeah, when I first came over, uh, Jay came in and wanted to play with the band. And at the time, I told him, I said, look, if, if I have enough trombone players student-wise, you know, I I can't do it because I can't take a faculty member over a student. It's for the students to begin with, you know. So I said, but if I don't have enough trombone players and I need somebody, yeah, I'd be glad to have you come in and play. And as it turned out, I did need somebody. So I had him come in and play. And I ended up thinking and believing that it was a good thing that he was there because I think it was good for the students to have somebody, you know, from faculty who's down to earth, you know, <laughs> and sit and play, you know. And and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't much better than they were at the time because he hadn't played in a long time. So he came in and you know the reading is not great. You know, so he's not a. He's not coming in as a great trombone player that's going to show everybody up and everything. So, but anyway, I kept him all those years, just because I thought, you know, number one. It was good for him. He was very interested in it. I, you know, and we've been friends for years. But I think it was good for the, you know, for the kids to have somebody, you know, mm -hmm. like that. So what was it like seeing Jay um, really blossom as, as a musician, partly under your tutelage? Well, he, he always asks me questions. <laughs> and he still does. <laughs> uh, 
it's good. He, I've always told Joe, Jay the truth. You know, I mean, he, he asked me some questions that are pretty, you know, straightforward. You got to give him an answer. Uh, one was, he's, if I practice an hour a day, can I be a good player? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, you'll get better. You know, every, you know, you do an hour a day, you're going to get better. You know, are you going to be, you know, Irby Green or Carl Fontana or somebody? No, not at an hour a day. You know, so I've always given him a direct answer when he's, even if it's like kind of bad news. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think he appreciates that, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But he's done well, you know, and and he still practices every day. To this day, he still works at it, you know. And he mentioned he's playing in a what he called a rehearsal band with with you these yeah, days. Yeah, right. I I have a rehearsal band meets every on well, the second Wednesday of every month, you know. And I put Jay in there because he's reached the point where. He definitely needs to play with better players, you know, because that's the way you learn how to play is, you know, when you get in with good people, you usually play up to them. You know, when you play with bad people, you usually play down to them. They just yank you down if you don't look out. Mm -hmm. So this way he gets to play with some pretty good players, mm -hmm. and it's good for him. Yeah. You know, so. Have you done any other kind of playing out with him? Um, no, I never played a job with him or anything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He does a lot of Dixieland things with the Dixieland band. Right. Uh, he plays uh, with Mark. Right, the Art uh, Jazz yeah. Orchestra. Yeah. 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 Um, speaking of Mark Harvey, um, um, the director of the, the Art Vark Jazz Orchestra and who teaches jazz harmony and mm -hmm. arranging and composition here, um, have you had any contact with him kind of professionally? And No. Uh, like I said the, before, the only thing I did was he had me over one day for his arranging class, mm -hmm. you know, to talk to them, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, I did. It was good. Mm -hmm. When it was over, he said, I'm glad I had you. He says, you know, he says maybe when they hear it from you, they'll believe it, <laughs> 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 as opposed to listening to him all the time <laughs> mm -hmm. say the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you're well regarded as a um, as an arranger, and you've written um, a, a two volume you know book on um, on jazz harmony and arranging. Yeah. Um, you have some particular ideas about about this. Can you? Um, I know it's it's hard to kind of summarize because there's a lot of of, of, of detail, and you, you can't really kind of water it down. But what are some uh, some of the main kind of points that go into your ideas about? Um, you know, harmony and, and arranging, because you have some very specific ideas in these books. Yeah, but the thing about arranging is it's mechanical as far as, you know, writing goes. There are, you can teach voicings, and you can, you can teach all the mechanics of writing, which you can't teach as somebody to be musical. So when you start teaching... I just broke it down. Like I told you before, it, when I was trying to learn to write, I read all these books and they don't tell me anything. Mm -hmm. I've just managed to, over the years through teaching, put everything in an order that is logical and works. Mm -hmm. And I don't ever talk about anything that won't work. I don't want to know what doesn't work. I want to know what works. So my whole approach to that has been like a positive. You know, mm -hmm. I tell the kids when I was teaching that I will never take anything away from you. Everything I say to you is good. All I'm going to do is keep adding to it. I'm never going to say, okay, you can forget that now. We're not going to use that anymore. So it just, you know, but you can teach mechanical voicings. They are mechanical. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do other things as you grow. You know, you want to experiment and this and that. Trouble with music is there's nothing that you can say is wrong. 
if somebody wants to take their arm and hit it on the piano like this and say, hey, that's what I want to hear, it's right. Mm -hmm. That's what they want to hear. That's it. You know, doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. you know, but as far as basic writing, you know, you want to write for bands or whatever, certain things they do. Right. Classical music, same thing. Right. Class. Everything is classical music is styles. You know, you want to write like Beethoven. You got to write. You got to do what he did. Harmony wise. You know, and and line wise and all that. You know, when I write Mozart, it's a style. Notes don't change. Right. Same notes. You know, just different harmonies at different times. Right. It's like the Leo Peepers band. I told you, a whole book didn't have a nine in it until you got to the last note of the to of the last tune. Lift you out of the chair. <laughs> Literally, when the first time I played that, I said, "Oh my God!" You know. Sounded wrong. The only nine in the whole book, but that's it's in style, mm -hmm. and and I'm you know like everything else, I'm def probably pretty conservative in everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm I believe in writing, at least from my standpoint. I'm never writing for myself. I'm always writing for somebody else. You know, if I'm going to write a chart for a band, got to be what they want. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't tell me, you know, note for note what they want, but it's got to be a style of some right. kind. Right. Are you yeah. taking into consideration certain individual um, um, players and stuff like that? Only if you're writing for a band, you know who it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I write for Hearst band. I knew all the players. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. you know, you know, you don't have the limitations. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, I wrote for a girl singer, several, but for one for years, and she traveled around the country. And I wrote from one to nine horns. You know, you keep adding. The hard way to write, and, and not good for the players, but in the end it sounds okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes she would have a trio. Sometimes she'd have one horn. Sometimes she'd have two. Once in a great while, she'd have a band. You know, well, she could use the same charts because, you know. But you also have to write because you don't know who the players are going to be. Mm -hmm. And she would get guys that couldn't read. You know, piano player couldn't read; he just played, or bass player, you know, or horn player, whatever. So you never know what you're going to get. So you have to write, number one, that you assume anybody that can play can play it. You know, you can't write off the wall mm -hmm. and accept, expect some guy in a club someplace to play it because they're not going to. Right. So you have to write for a purpose all the time. Yeah. So in your um, your books on um, arranging, you're not mentioning particular styles, um, but was there a, kind of an implied style that you were kind of teaching the students? No, it's just pretty much what is normally used in basic writing. Uh, and you're thinking, Anybody. you're thinking kind of big band. Um, yeah, big yeah. band. Yeah, you're yeah. teaching big band writing. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the the small when I wrote the books. The second book is 300 pages, and I had to stop. And I, di I didn't get the small band writing. I didn't get the vocal writing. I didn't get the string writing. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't get to any of that. And the book is still like, yeah, you know, 300 pages. So I just stopped at, at big band writing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but there's all kinds of, you know, things you can do. But the basics are the same. You know, mm -hmm. you have to know. You know, you have to know chord progression for one thing, right? Because if you write the wrong change, it's going to sound wrong no matter what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can voice it any way you want, but it won't work. Right. So. Right. Yeah. So it looks like we're running out of time here. Yeah. <laughs> five. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got five. Yeah. Um, I'm just um, end with that. Sure. Um, 
So um, on um, March 4th, um, 2011, just a few weeks back, you were um, guest director of the, um, the Festival Jazz Ensemble. Fred invited you back. Yes. Do you want to talk about that experience? And uh, this is a little strange in a way because it's the first time I've been in front of any kind of a school band for a little while. <laughs> so it's kind of like going back, mm -hmm. you know, from what I used to do. So how, how but, did it feel like the, working with MIT students now? And yeah, well, the, the kids did a great job, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, Fred had, you know, run some of the stuff down before I, you know, got there. So mm -hmm. I didn't have to do too much rehearsing at all. I just, you know, let them play and then talk about a couple of things here and there. And But they did a, you know, a real good job. And it was, it was enjoyable. You know, with the concert and all, you mm -hmm. know, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So the, you know, level of student is still, you know, still pretty good as far as players go. Yeah. So tell me about what you're currently up to these days. You have a, a, a group. Um, I do a tribute to Benny Goodman and Peggy Lee that I've been doing. I, I used to do Benny Goodman for a number of years, did a lot of summer concerts and, you know, did a lot of work actually with that. And then we added the Peggy Lee thing, a uh, girl named Amanda Carr is a singer. She does a really nice job on that. Uh, but we put the program together, she came over and we, you know, decided what tunes to do and all that. Then I had to naturally write the whole thing. <laughs> so that was a project and a half, but it it works really well. People love it. We travel. In '08, we went did a live. Uh, we did a thing for a company called Live on Stage, and we traveled around the country. We were in Texas and Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, East Coast, Maryland, and New Jersey, and all those places. But we did a whole tour. And then we ended up in California was the last trip we made. But we've been doing that, uh, which has been going very well. Do it locally. In fact, we're doing it uh, May 8th at the Regent Theater in Arlington, doing a concert over there. And I got a, another date in Pennsylvania. These are isolated, they're kind of hard. Because you, you spend three days to work two hours. <laughs> so, and then a date up in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So, uh oh, they're Vermont. <laughs> yeah, they're spread out, but they, you know, you, it's that's what I do now. So, yeah. and and I don't care that there's not quite that much work, because I'm traveled all my life. So it's, I still like it, you know, because it's enjoyable. But it gets a little bit harder, mm -hmm. you know, from year to year. And do, you know, a few things locally, you know, when somebody calls. Mm -hmm. Don Pendleton um, has a Hal McIntyre book, and he does some things in the summertime, and I play with him, you know, when he does those things. So just, you know, local things, mm -hmm. whatever comes up. And still writing, mostly for myself. Just I'm in the finale now, so that's the computer program. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to get into it, but it's weird. I have a lot of ex students that I'm still in touch with, and this guy is in upstate New York now. But uh, he insisted I get into, uh, and he's into computers, so he's. He said, "Oh, I'm gonna. I got stuff in the basement. I'm gonna put it together for you and ship it up to you." <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how I got started. Wow. And then I have friends around that when I need help, I can call. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually doing well now. That's so great. I didn't think I would learn that at this age, but <laughs> you did it. Yeah, I did it. Yeah. Surprised a couple of people. I'll tell you. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> 